you can't kill all the cancer cells without killing the patient. It's mm -hmm. not possible. You know, so, so what you're doing is you're here, here's the person up here in the lower hand is the tumor, the vi relative viability. And as you give chemo or radiation, guess what? They're both, the cancer cells die faster. You know, they say, oh, the tumor's really, really sh shrinking because they're not as viable as, as your mm -hmm. normal cells. So no surprise that the cancer cells die off really, really quickly, but you're coming down too, mm -hmm. you see. And they have to stop it at some point before they kill the patient, but you can't kill all the cancer cells without killing the patient. So you leave the most resilient cancer cells are left in a less resilient host, patient. Hello and welcome to the Biology of Business. I'm Kate and today we have the absolute pleasure of being joined by Dr. David Rasnick. Hello, Dave. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, hello, Kate. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, so we've got this time difference with the, the change in the clocks between British summertime and US summertime. I don't know what you call it. We call it daylight savings. Time. Daylight savings. As if you could really save daylight. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, your background is as a chemist and more recently in cancer research. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, I got my PhD. Uh, I have degrees in biology and chemistry and a PhD degree in chemistry uh, at, at Georgia Institute of Technology. And I've specialized in organic chemistry and biochemistry. I worked about uh, two decades in the pharmaceutical biotech industry on uh, the tissue destroying diseases like arthritis, emphysema, parasites, and cancer. And uh, I had my own little companies, biotech companies. So I was independent. I didn't depend on government grants or any of that sort of thing. So I was very good position to be uh, where I wasn't beholding to anyone except uh, my company. It either worked or it didn't work, you know. Uh, I think that explains a lot of why I was able to do things that most people in academe and industry can't do unless they own their own company, <laughs> you know. I left the biotech industry for good in 1996. And I was in San Francisco Bay Area. I went across the Bay to uh, Berkeley and joined up with Professor Peter Duesberg at the University of California at Berkeley. He's a very famous biologist, biochemist there. He was expert on retroviruses and cancer. He's a can major cancer researcher. And he and I joined up. Uh, I was there to support him uh, with his opposition to the contagious HIV hypothesis of AIDS. And I agreed with him and I was wanted to just assist him, which I thought give him a little physical moral support for few weeks or months. Well, I worked with him for 10 years and we published a lot of papers on AIDS, a lot, a lot of, uh, on cancer and held some conferences on both, very productive. And we did all sorts of things, went all over the world on this stuff. And it was a whole life that I had never, ever anticipated. Uh, and it basically got started in the mid 1980s with the AIDS stuff when I moved to San Francisco. I was one of two chemists that was hired in 1978 by uh, Abbott Laboratories to set up their diagnost the chemistry group in their diagnostics division. So I learned a lot about clinical diagnostics while I was there too. And then I left there in 1980, moved to California in 1980, set up my own little company with, with another guy and uh, worked there, like I said, uh, arthritis, emphysema, parasites, and cancer, the tissue destroying diseases had some collaborations with, with other large companies, took some of our molecules that we synthesized as enzyme inhibitors, because the enzymes, especially proteases, are the principal destructive agents, tissue destroying agents in these tissue destroying diseases. And uh, we were trying to develop some of those for those various tissue destroying diseases. The best results were in parasites, very, very great results there. And, uh, then the arthritis, we had a big collaboration going in. And I won't go into all those details because we're gonna basically focus on cancer today. I understand that. But I had a broad a broad background in these areas. And then I, with the AIDS popped out, especially San Francisco, it was one of the uh, hot, hot spots. And I was really curious about what it was like most of my colleagues in the Bay Area. We all wanted to work on it, but nobody knew what it really was, we thought. And uh, then in 1984, 
the U.S. government declared on April 23rd in a press conference that AIDS was caused by a retrovirus. Uh, it well, it came out of Africa. It was sexually transmitted, and it was invariably fatal. And that became government dogma on that day. There was no publication at all anywhere in the world on that stuff. And I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. And then we really got interested in it uh, until about a year later in 1985, it turns out that AIDS wasn't behaving anything like a contagious disease. I mean, it's a little virus with basically three primary genes in it that somehow knew whether or not you were gay or straight, white or black, rich or poor, or what zip code you lived in, you know. And so I said, something's wrong here. And uh, that's when I came in contact with Peter Duesberg through his literature. And I said, aha, this famous retrovirologist is saying the same thing, except even better. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I sort of started changing and started really, really digging into what was going on. Sort of so the, the, the AIDS and HIV story is basically an illusion that you are. It, 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 it's a fraud. It's worse than an illusion. An illusion means it's not intentional. It, it was a fraud from the very beginning. It was basically, it started out, I'll learn this later, 1984 was the end of the first term of Reagan's first term in office as president. And that was the first four years of AIDS in the United States. And that was election year in 84, and he's, the Republicans were afraid the Democrats might turn AIDS into a campaign issue. And that's what led to the, uh, the press conference on April 23rd, 1984. They brought in Robert Gallo of the National Cancer Institute. He, he offered up one of his retroviruses as the cause of cancer. The government that day turned it into dogma that we live with to this day. And there was no scientific ba background or basis for it at all. And uh, previously, before that, before, before that press conference, my colleagues and I from the Bay Area would get together once a month and talk about all sorts of things, including AIDS, what it was. Right after the, that, breath, uh, the, that press conference, a year later, when I realized that there was something wrong, it's not behaving like a contagious disease, my friends and colleagues would not talk to me about it. And that was unusual for scientists not to talk about anything. That's when I really knew something was wrong and I got into it. And then my whole life went in a completely different direction. It's one, yeah, also so one of the reasons why I left the pharmaceutical industry. The fact you were silenced by colleagues or colleagues were stonewalling you, being silent to you, actually confirmed I'm over target in some shape or form. That's here. right. That's absolutely it. Now, I didn't know all those details at the time. I just knew something was wrong. Yeah. These people that we could talk about anything for about four or five years, you know, and now all of a sudden uh, we couldn't. And I lost a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues. And the best collaboration I had at the time was with this parasitologist. And he and I agreed we wanted to maintain our collaboration. So he, he, he suggested that we don't talk about AIDS. So I said, OK, we won't talk about AIDS. And I kept that collaboration. Now, isn't that weird, you know, for professionals, you can't talk about something? So the dogma was cast, set for political motives with supporting funding and people therefore had a vested interest in staying silent for self-preservation or other motives. And I, I, I learned, I really, really wanted to know what was going on here. The scientific curiosity in me is why now do all these colleagues behave so differently about a subject that we could talk about for years, you know? And I learned a lot. And one of the best books that helped me along was by Jeff Schmidt, Disciplined Minds. How it was that people, highly educated people that could influence other people, for example, how it is that they become so cowed, you know, and they're basically controlled. It's a very, very good book. And that's that, and a host of other things. And then that's when I started opening up. And I really, really, really became a scientist after that because I started questioning everything. So you were yeah. then driven by curiosity of yeah. why, why, by the sense of it, why, yeah. why, why? Yeah, but it, it, yeah, I couldn't, it was totally, totally crazy. And then when I joined up with Peter Duesberg in 1996, you know, we worked on the AIDS stuff because he was one of, he was like me, only he was a retrovirologist expert on it. Member of the National Academy of Sciences would have gotten a Nobel Prize had he not spoken out against the HIV hypothesis. And so I went there. You know, and he was a cancer researcher and I was too. So what we would do is we'd work together on AIDS, 
we published a number of papers, had three conferences on it and everything. And then we'd alternate after we exhausted ourselves on that, then we'd work on a cancer and, you know, spend months, half a year or whatever on that, you know, publish stuff on that, and we could go back and forth. And you know what was, uh, that was an excellent combination, an excellent combination because one, it was the, the aid stuff was what we had to do as citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we as citizen scientists and we ha had to do our best and we'd fight that, put our energy in it and everything. And then you have to catch your breath. <laughs> Mm. And then the other thing that was that was really like we it, maybe I'll get to talking about cancer for the day, <laughs> you know, but um, and then we'd work on our cancer research and everything, and um, which is and it had had it not been for AIDS, I would have never met Peter Duesberg, and we would not have gotten to get, together and worked on cancer to produce the most important scientific work of my of my life as a cancer researcher. I published a whole lot on it, a lot of papers on it, including a book. I wrote a book on it and uh, uh, a published book. And uh, so uh, th all this story, I mean, it, I think it's interesting when I, I'm just about to start talking about cancer. Just and I just wanted to give a little background first because the story I'm going to tell is very, very different than most people think cancer is. Before we move on to talking about cancer, what I just wanted to pick up on was that you were driven by curiosity and you used the term as a citizen scientist, like so yep. you had a social responsibility to it. Right. What do you think it was in your background that gave you that motivation, that curiosity, that responsibility that perhaps some of your colleagues were lacking? I'm an outsider. I'm an outsider. I always have been uh, from high school, grammar school, high school. Um, uh, lots of things independent I had my own company you know uh i i left abbott because i didn't care for that large company it, and i didn't like their ethics and i couldn't quite put my finger on it but then i had the opportunity to uh, move a small company from indianapolis out to california uh and i would be the boss you know so uh i i jumped on it you know adventure and uh, moved that company out there, built it up with my own hands and hired some very, very good people and uh, had it for 10 years. And um, like I say, I was not beholden to anybody. Only looking back, you know, I, I, I thought that my colleagues in academe and the big companies, I thought they were, they were, I thought they were like me in a way. You know, oh, this is interesting. Let's work on it. It's interesting. Let's work on it. But uh, yeah, it is interesting, but they can't work on it. You see, like the, the academics, they have to get grant support. And, and if, they were going, if they were going to tell the truth in their grants proposals about what they were really going to do, they wouldn't get, they wouldn't get grant support. So they have to lie a little bit to do this. So it's, become, it's become endemic. And they can't question. In fact, some of the people, when they, when they talked about the, the academics at University of California, San Francisco, Peter was at U University of California, Berkeley. They, uh, when Peter was shunned and he hasn't had a graduate student since, uh, I think, early 1997s. I think that was when his last one finished, early 1990s, I mean. And uh, hadn't had a grant support since 1987. Uh, and he's been punished for speaking out. And the, you know what the people at UC, University of California, said, the faculty there say, Peter doesn't know how to play the game. You say, the game. They know how to play the game. And if he would just keep his mouth shut, uh, you know, he'd get all his money again. He'd get his Nobel Prize and all that kind of stuff. Now, that was back in the 80s and the 90s. And we're seeing the consequences now uh, in the 20, uh, 21st century about what, it's, what that has done to the, the global thinking in terms of professionals, especially professionals, you know. And that's, again, why I go back to that book, uh, Disciplined Minds by Jeff Schmidt. It talks about that. And, uh, and how we get there. Plus, I've learned from so many other people around the world from this COVID stuff and all these Zoom meetings and everything, get to meet people from all over the world. We're teaching each other stuff, you know? And it's amazing how much we are learning. I've never learned so much in my entire life as I have over the past three years, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, with this stuff. Are we ever going to get to cancer? Yes, we are. <laughs> Come on then. That's what I invited you to talk about. So 
as I mentioned, Dave, the majority of listeners are physical therapists. Right. And physical therapists, we're just trained. It's just yeah. trained to screen for cancer. Your first meeting of a patient, you know you're looking out for red flags. Because if somebody's right. got what we would term red flags, and very typically that would be weight yeah. loss, unremitting pain at night, and a pattern of pain that isn't mechanical. It's not telling a mechanical story. Mm -hmm. And if we see those things, we're referring off. Um, and we're just doing it. It's just almost, it's trained into us that, on the, that, that you're looking out for these red flags. All right. So I'm going to just go uh, to my little PowerPoint presentation here and start from that. I'm going to share this presentation. Let's go back to sharing, share screen. Let's see here. That's this one. In there. No, th this is the one I want. Okay, hold shift to select multiple windows. Okay, that's the one I want to share. Okay. So I know you can see the little slides on the left plus the big one in the middle. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this was the talk that I gave well, many times, different, different varieties. Two competing theories of cancer. Most, the dominant theory of cancer among cancer researchers and oncologists the gene mutation theory of cancer. You hear about all these cancer genes and all of that. Um, well, it turns out there's no support for it at all. And I even get into that a little bit. It's totally wrong, basically. There's no such thing as a cancer gene, an oncogene, or anything like that. Uh, all and, the screenings that... Yeah, all, it's total nonsense. And then, now, that's easy for me to say, but then I got all, all these, that book and all these uh, PowerPoint slides to say, explain why. Uh, and then the other theory is called aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is the fancy word for unbalanced chromosomes. And fortunately, your audience, they know the word chromosome. They know it's uh, these little bow ties. We'll show pictures of it. They look like under a microscope, but they're basically, they, they're where our genes, our DNA is, the linear DNA. In humans, we have 46 chromosomes, two pairs of um, 23 chromosomes. And, uh, and I'll be getting into that. Okay. Down syndrome would be the most common aneuploidy that we'd all be familiar with. Commonality in the sense of the chromosomes you're talking about? Uh, commonality in terms of an aneuploidy that we'd all be, most people would be familiar with. Would yeah, aneuploidy is an imbalance in the number of chromosomes. Okay. And uh, here, here's, I think, an interesting slide to start with. I, I had to attack the gene mutation theory because it's so entrenched with the, with the oncologist, with the public at large, with Hollywood, government, everybody puts so much weight into genes. They, and, and they're basically wrong. The genes are important just as a dictionary is important, you know. But a dictionary are just the little elements that you use to compose sentences and write books and all of that. You couldn't have life or a novel without a dictionary, all right? But the novel is so much more and so much different from the dictionary. Mm -hmm. and, and life is so much more and different from the dictionary, which we call genes. The genome is basically a biological dictionary about how you make proteins, primarily how you make proteins. And you put them together and they say, ah, there's a gene for this and a gene for that. It's total nonsense. And here's the little... This little slide, genes are a biological dictionary. What came as a big, huge shock to the gene sequencing people of the 90s was that, you know, they used to think that humans had 100,000 genes because we're the, we're the smartest creature on the planet, so we have to have the more genes than anything else. So, we, you know, the, the, we have that 100,000 genes or more or whatever. And that number kept shrinking down over the years. But the big shock was that... Uh, uh, mice and humans have a 99% of, of our genes are identical. 99% of the mouse gene and human, and human genes are identical. And most of them, over 90%, come in the same sequence, although we do have a different number of chromosomes. And uh, I met uh, Lisa Stubbs once. She worked at a lab just east of mine in, in Livermore, and I was uh, in Dublin, California at the time, a short drive away. And this is what she said, I know of only a few cases 
in which no mouse counterpart can be found for a particular human gene. And for the most part, we see essentially a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two species. So the question is, how do the same, uh, basically 20,000 genes, the mouse and humans, it's not, not even exact, not even quite 20,000, but we have almost exactly the same number of genes, almost like they're 99% identical. Now, how do those genes know to make a human? And when do they know how to make a mouse, <laughs> for example? You know, so it can't, it's like in a dictionary. You know, how does that dictionary know how to make a novel? And how does it know how to make a scientific publication? Of course, it doesn't, even though we use pretty much the same Oxford English dictionary. Mm. So that should have been the first problem. And it was a serious problem with the gene people. But unfortunately, because of the status quo, that genes are everything. The pharmaceutical company needs genes because they have a gene target for this or that to make a drug with. And, and that is also what's taught in undergraduate school and graduate school and probably in high school. You have to keep that going. You have to keep the centrality of the gene going. And I know from my, my, my experience in the pharmaceutical industry, it's all about target. Because back in my day, the targets were like, uh, I was making enzyme inhibitors and the target for cancer were these enzymes that chew up cartilage or chew up other tissues in your body. You know, and so that's a target. That's a molecule, a molecular target. It's an enzyme. I make my synthetic inhibitor to bind to that target and inhibit it and cure cancer. <laughs> you see, that that was the model. And that's the pharmaceutical model for everything. Find the target. And the, and and that's what they do. With viruses. Now the, now the targets are viruses, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And they don't understand biology and they don't really want to understand biology. They just want to keep the gene centric thing going or the viral thing going, which presents a target also for drugs or vaccines or whatever. And uh, so that that's why the people in academe and industry don't resist. They keep that because they have to keep maintaining that fiction. I'm really uh, thinking you've seen the story that viruses cause cancer too. Yeah, and they don't. <laughs> they absolutely do not cause cancer. We can talk about viruses too, if you want to at some point. Okay, I just talked about the gene-centric view. And here, this marvelous chart. There's this big chart. There's, you know, these things just kept getting bigger. When I was in, uh, uh, in the biz in the 80s and 90s and everything, the drug companies would give you these charts to hang in your lab, you know. It mark, in this case, it was Roche. And these are uh, biochemical pathways. Uh, you, you should supposed to be dazzled by all of this stuff because each one of these things is like a little pathway with an enzyme here leading a product there and another one, and you know respiratory areas and all this. And each one of those things is a target uh, or a potential target. And it's our twenty thousand genes code for these proteins. And proteins do the work of biology, and they're all mixed in here, and they're doing all this stuff. And this is meant to dazzle people, and it does. And every year, these things just get, get bigger and bigger. And that is not the story at all. That's where the pharmaceutical industry is. And you will never understand life or biology if you focus on these, these, these charts right here. You have to think in a different way. Now, I want to uh, show you. Oh, I should have left it up like this. Uh, show you that um, the mainstream people are not completely stupid, actually. They know the cancer research is what I'm talking about. This is uh, Gerald Dermer. Uh, this quote was taken from his book, The Immortal Cell, Why Cancer Research Fails. And I'll just read it to folks. Perhaps the most damning evidence against the oncogene or the gene theory is the fact that the supposed human oncogenes uh, do not transform true normal cells which have a normal set of chromosomes. Furthermore, there's absolutely no evidence from observations of human tumors to indicate that the mutation in any proto-oncogene, that's an unmutated cancer gene, is essential for cancer initiation. In fact, in many tumors, all the proposed proto-oncogenes are normal and there are no oncogenes uh, present. The cancer people know this. The mainstream cancer people know uh, that there are serious, serious problems uh, with their cancer, the cancer gene theory. Here's more examples. This is Bruce Albert, who, Bruce Alberts, who writes lots of textbooks and this one down here, Molecular Biology of the Cell, 2014, I took it from that one. Chapter 20, look at it, on page 
1094. It's a huge, huge book. And this is just the, the part devoted to cancer. And here's what he has to say. And this is astounding. Human DNA has 3 billion nucleotides. Every time a cell divides, there is about one uncorrected mutation for every 1 billion nucleotides. Thus, there are about three random mutations every time a cell divides. That's astounding in its own right. How, how reliable and reproducible cell division is and replication of DNA. Now, continue on. This is also astounding. There are 10,000 trillion cell divisions during the course of a human life. Based on this, every single gene is likely to have undergone mutation on about 10 billion separate occasions. And so here's this is, are normal. And, and this is just normal, just based on the normal background, three mutations per, uh, you, you know, per your whole genome. And it says, from this point of view, the problem of cancer seems to be not why it occurs, but why it occurs so infrequently. Mm -hmm. In other words, with all of these mutations that they're talking about, you know, every, every gene you'd have, what do you say? Every single gene is likely to have undergone mutation on about 10 billion separate occasions. And if mutations led to cancer, there would be no, we'd all be hamburger. <laughs> or just, it's all, I'll just be cancer cells. So mutations are normal. They're a normal yeah. occurrence in dividing cells, in living cells. Right. And life is robust. Yeah. Basically, this says life is extraordinarily robust. And not and, static. Not static. And if, if mutations cause cancer, if there was such a thing as a cancer gene, we're, there would be no humans, there'd be no mice, there'd be no, be no nothing. <laughs> okay. And, and that, was written, that was written by people in the business, you know, cancer researchers. So therefore, the question becomes, actually, what is an oncogene? Because if mutations are normal, they're not actually, what, what is an oncogene? Because it's oncogene, normal, it's changed. It's a fantasy. Mm. Oncogene is a word uh, that is meant, that the, the principle is, is that uh, there's such a thing as oncogene. In other words, a normal gene, once it's mutated, can turn a normal cell into a cancer cell. That's the definition of oncogene. And since that didn't work, they said, well, you had to have two or three or four, or then they had the seven oncogene gene, mutari gene mutation theory of cancer. But all those mutations had to be in the same cell, you know, in order, order that to happen. There are so many problems with the oncogene theory of cancer, and these people know it, but they can't, they can say it in public to cancer researchers, but they can't say it in public, like on television, you know. Yes, so the yeah. over. Right. So now we'll move into what cancer, you know, what, what, it, what it really is. And uh, people understood what cancer was back in the late 19th century. David Hanselman uh, was the first guy to uh, describe cancer cells. And they, they called chromos uh, the chromatin was in the cell. They called the chromosomes chromatin. And he drew these pictures looking under a microscope. And... Uh, Here's what he saw under the microscope. He saw all the, these are cells that are in the process of dividing. And you can see almost all of them except for number 10 down here. This looks like this might be a normal cell for reference because you can see what he called chromatin, we call chromosomes, the cells dividing. And they look like they're e equally balanced, which is normal in a normal cell. All the other ones, the division of chromosomes are unbalanced in all of these other cells that, that he's writing about. In fact, let's, this is what he had to say. The cell of a malignant tumor is a cell with a certain, certain abnormal chromatin content. You know, we call it aneuploidy now. And, and that was in the late 1800s, 1891. Now, Theodore Boveri was another German, uh, uh, Hanselman was a cancer researcher. Boveri was basically what we'd call a devel developmental biologist, but they, Kanselman and Bovary, they knew each other, and uh, uh, and and they under Bovary in those days uh, these fields crossed over quite a lot, and he understood, and he even wrote a book about cancer. And uh, in uh, 1914, he published it. We'll get to that. And he formulated the aneuploidy or chromosomal imbalance theory of cancer in 1914. He did not use those words; those are our language now. The essence of cancer, he said 
is uh, was a certain abnormal chromatin constitution. That's aneuploidy. The way in which it originates having no significance. Each process which brings about this chromatin constitution would result in the origin of a malignant tumor. He was absolutely right about that. He wrote a book about it. And virtually everything he had in that book, everything he had, I, could, I can't really recall a single thing he got wrong about it, but all the various aspects of cancer, he was right, had the, hit, hit the nail dead center with that hammer. And, um, and, he, but he, and he published that monograph in 1914. That was the year World War I broke out. I'll go back this way. We'll get back to that in a minute. World War I broke out in 1914, and Bovary died in 1915. And so you had his death and World War I going on. So his book didn't get very far. There wasn't, didn't get much traction mm. uh, during that time. And then during the period between the wars, between World War I and World War II, it was not very good in Germany at all. Basically, World War II came along. And and, and Bovary's stuff really didn't take off until after World War II, a little bit, but unfortunately, lots of other things changed. There was nobody really there to, to drive, drive his theory, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Now, we may come back to this or not, but now I want to get into cancer, more or less what uh, people want to know when I asked you, how do you uh, screen people for cancer? That was, you know, that was a very uh, pertinent question when I asked you that. Mm -hmm. Here's how it's done with a microscope using the pap smear. And also, it's the same approach that Hanselman and Bovary would use, looking under a microscope, looking at the cells and looking at what they call the chromatin, we call the chromosomes in the cells, in the nucleus. And up here, you see this blue arrow. So here we are, uh, normal cells and cancer cells. They have the same genes, remember? They have identically the same genes that normal cells and cancer cells do but they don't have the same complement of chromosomes. You can see up here at the upper right, this blue arrow is pointing to the nucleus of a cervical cell. It has a large, you see these large cytoplasms and then the dark little center, that's the nucleus of these cervical cells. And they have the normal complement of 46 chromosomes. But these cancer cells down here are noticeably different. They have huge, huge nuclei. And, and you can see very sl slender, cytoplasm around these particular cancer cells, but they can look, every one of them is different. No two are alike. But this is what pathologists use when they want to diagnose cancer or precancerous condition. They're basically going all the way to Papa Nicolai, going all the way to David Hanselman back in the 1900s, you know, they and then the microscope, they look at the huge difference between in the nucleus of a cell, of a cancer cell versus a normal cell, adjacent normal cells. They're looking for a distorted nucleus, a very large, oversized nucleus, which is giving the indication that there's an abnormal amount of chromatin in there. Exactly. Typically, like the normal cell has 46 chromosomes. Exactly. Cancer cells typically have between 60 and 90. And I've seen when I, we examined cervical cancer cells from Vietnam uh, back in the, when did we do this? When did we do this? 90s in the 90s, yeah, late 90s. Uh, I saw nearly a thousand chromosomes. A lot of them they were broken and everything. Couldn't count them. There were so many there. But all along, as long as there's been a microscope, people, the the people, the pathologists, the uh, uh, people who are diagnosing cancer, they look at the these cells. And the reason these nuclei are so much longer, they uh, larger, they have so many more chromosomes in them. And uh, I learned from the uh, the cytologist. Uh, that actually diagnose cancer on a routine basis, that their rule is to look for a threefold increase in the size of the nucleus, threefold for frank cancer, you know, and they would give it all these different grades and everything. So this is how people have been screening for it. And they still do with the pap smear to this day. Ever since there's been a light microscope and it works. <laughs> it really, honest, honest to goodness works. If you try to screen using uh, gene mutations or this or that, it's totally bogus. It won't get you anywhere. And they're almost always wrong. When they're right, it's, it's pure chance. It's like tossing a coin. How about um, the PET scan the, or the CT scan? CAT scan and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, you can, you can look at uh, abnormal shapes. Uh, you think things are large, but they could be enlarged, but it doesn't make them cancer. 
you know, there's lots of reasons. I had a, a lady here recently had a, uh, a problem, had her spleen, a neighbor had her spleen uh, removed. It weighed uh, 2.6 pounds. For you medical folks, or you, you know, that's a huge, huge and large spleen, 2.6 pounds, <laughs> you know, and there was no cancer in it, you know. They have to do, they have to, uh, the pathologist has to take sections of that tissue, look at it under the microscope to look at the cells to see whether or not, the only way they can diagnose it if it's cancer is by looking at the cells themselves, mm -hmm. you say, and that's what they do to, to, to this day. That's, that's what they do. Um, so anyway, let me, I have to speed this up a little bit. Uh, here, here is, I won't even do the big screen. You can see this colorful chromosomes, right? Mm. Not a problem. I won't enlarge the screen then. Uh, these are just a modern way of looking at the chromosomes where you can stain them. Even I can identify them when they're done like this with these colors. On the left is a normal uh, diploid, meaning double set of chromosomes, 23 different chromosomes uh, come in pairs. Chromosome one, two, three, four, you get the idea. You go all the way down here and then you get to the, X cro to the uh, sex chromosomes. Uh, here is the uh, X chromosome and the Y chromosome for a male. And uh, females, of course, have no Y chromosome. They have uh, uh, two X chromosomes. And then over here, you have a cancer cell. And look how easy, it, what the huge difference is between this normal set of chromosomes and this cancer cell. Uh, chromosome uh, two is entirely missing up here. But uh, I'll tell you, th there's one thing, you have to have at least one copy of every chromosome for a cell to survive, even a cancer cell. So those chromosome, that chromosome two that's missing is down in here somewhere, down here on the bottom, mixed in with something else. We, these are called marker chromosomes. And we have three copies of chromosome number three, one copy of what was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, of eight. <laughs> you say, but you have all these different copies. And then these are called marker chromosomes. These are chromosomes that have been broken off and reattached. Re and that's why they have multiple colors. You see all these multiple colors down here. Now, guess what? This, this collection of chromosomes in this one cell is unique. No other cancer cell in the world or in that person's body has exactly this combination of chromosomes. No two cancer cells are identical. They're like, they're like shuffling a deck of cards. And the, and the fact that no two, no two cancer cells have the same number of chromosomes is the excuse given uh, by the, the gene mutation people that, uh, well, well, there's no target for one thing. They don't say that. But there's no, there's no unique target. That's the real reason why, why, why they don't want to study it. Because where are you going to make a drug? Because every one of these is different. What, what's your target? What are you going to do? Uh, that's the real reason. But they just sloughed it off. They said, well, cancer is a unique thing, you know, implying that. So, but there's nothing unique here. Since every, all of these are different. Remember that there's got to be a unique target. Like there's got to be, for every disease, there is a unique cause. That's, that's the thinking. Of course, that's not true. For, for many diseases, that is true. For, for many, that's not true. And so when they use the fact that no two cancer cells have the same combination of chromosomes, how am I gonna, how am I gonna learn anything and use that, use that information to do anything about cancer? Thanks. So they just slough it off. The cell on the right looks a pretty sickly cell. Is that actually able, capable of dividing, of cell division? Yeah, yes, absolutely. It, uh, and I will get into that. We'll get into that. But uh, since you answered the, asked the question now, I'll talk about it right now. M most cancer cells, even in a lethal tumor, are dying. There's a huge amount of necrotic tissue in, in, in tumors because these cells, all aneuploid cells are damaged cells. Every one of them is a damaged cell. We probably all have cancer cells in us. They come and they go. Cosmic rays, gamma rays, just, you know, you get an imbalance in chromosomes. And uh, the cells have to progress, and we'll talk about that. It's very difficult for cancer cells to progress, even survive. Uh, uh, I might as well move on from that, because that's a, I, 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 what you see me doing here now, I'm just giving this big, long lect lecture. <laughs> so I gave that two-hour lecture, but we don't want to do that today.
Uh, let's, yeah, here, I'll, I'll go with this one right here. And it shows the progression of cancer, all right? And here's a normal cell, just a schematic. Here's our 23 chromosomes down here on, on the horizontal axis. And, our nor and the copy number, there's two copies of each one for a, a, a 46 chromosomes. This is a normal cell, and a DNA index is just the, uh, the number of chromosomes in a cell divided by the normal number, which is 46. So 46 divided by 46 is one. So normal cells have a DNA index of one, and they're balanced, all right? Now we move to the next one. Here is initiation. Let's say uh, th this cell right here, you see it's unbalanced. It's got three copies of chromosome two. It's got one copy of chromosome five and so on here. You see it's unbalanced. And when you, you take all of these chromosomes together, you add all, all of them up and you divide it by 46. The DNA index is here. And this precancer is between 0.5. In other words, it's 50% of normal to a, about 1.2. Mm -hmm. You see DNA index at 1.2. So that's, you can even have a DNA index of one, but it's in unbalanced. For example, all you gotta do is increase the number of one chromosome and decrease the number of another chromosome and you still wind up with 46, but they're unbalanced. The imbalance is, is the key to cancer, all right? Now, as we progress, we go to the next one. Okay, now here, we, the cancer starts to progress and you have a lot more chromosome in here. We have a DNA index of 1.9 instead of one. So we're, we're close to twice the number of chromosomes. This is called a tetra, tetraploidization. It has to happen, and I'll get into that in a moment. You have to go through this doubling process of unbalanced chromosomes in order for cancer to progress. Because it's every this, this other, this one we started with right here, this is damaged cell, just low, Level aneuploidy, this is damaged cell. The cells generally die. They don't go anywhere. They can't progress. They can't, the cell division won't take place. You have to have balanced forces for that to happen. All right? And as that keeps increasing and getting more and more imbalanced, the more and more likely it is that the cell's going to divide, uh, die. So, so in the, order for it to progress, it has to get beyond that. You, you look like you have a question. No, I was just wanting to clarify this. So when the cell is in balance when you've got the aneuploidy in the cell it's a poorly cell yeah and the greater that aneuploidy ratio is the less likely it is that the cell's able to divide and survive and they survive. typically they, they typically lay dormant and don't do anything or they die okay and only you know that's why it takes decades for solid cancers to progress after you get that this low level aneuploidy right here it takes decades, about 40 years for uh, uh, breast cancer, for or cervical cancer, something like that, to, to progress. You know, and the basis of that is, is because these cells are so damaged, they're dying out in droves. You have, it's, typically, it takes a, a constant dose of carcinogen, mm -hmm. you know, like cigarette smokers. Most uh, lung cancer patients smoke cigarettes, but most people that smoke don't get lung cancer, you say. Mm. Uh, and it's a, it's a constant hit of carcinogens, constant hit of carcinogens, you know, that keep that that uh, keep sort of putting fuel to the fire, and you keep increasing the population of these aneuploid cells. And at some point, on the, it's like uh, it's, it's just like a lottery. At some point, if you have enough of this going on, remember we have uh, ten trillion cells in our body. You know, if this stuff's going on. It's like buying lottery tickets. So there could be a cell in there or some cells that actually win the lottery and they can do this, do this tetraploidization where they get beyond. The, 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 the limit that we've determined is a DNA index of about 1.3. There's a barrier there. Mm. And it, most of those, the cells in order to produce cancer have to get above that barrier, have to jump over that barrier. And, and that's what's called tetraploidization. Typically what happens a cell that, that has not enough, it can't, like we go back to this one here, it can't divide, it sits there, but what these, but, it, but it's still not too unhealthy. What they'll do is, is try to undergo another cycle of replication, which means then, you know, to get cell division, you have to double your chromosomes. It, you have in your cell, you're 46, now it becomes what, 92, 
Then your cells divide, go back to 46 and 46 for normal cells, mm -hmm. all right? Cancer cells have to do the same thing. So you have to uh, du double the number of chromosomes that you have in there. And the, with human cells, if they're not really, really balanced perfectly, the cells will not divide. That's the beauty of creatures that live long like we do, elephants and humans and, and things like in tortoises. You know, we have very, uh, our chromosomes look like uh, chess pieces compared to a mouse's checkers. Uh, and you always find that you have more complexity of chromosomes, the more long live the organism. Because the, the thing is that they have to be really, really balanced precisely with those chromosomes in order to pull the cells apart and, the, and let them, the chromosomes apart and divide. So the cells will, they'll break apart, they'll do different things, they'll break, the chromosomes will break apart, they'll do everything they can to try to bring that balance back for the chromosomes during cell division. And some will, because they break this chromosome off and restitch it over here or do whatever, and physically they can balance it, and then they go through a cell division, and, and now they have an excess of chromosomes. Once you get to this tetraploidization, which doesn't last long, on the order of months probably, then, then these cells start losing chromosomes, and then you start coming down to something like this, from a 1.9 after, after duplication, to now you get these cells of, approximately a DNA index of 1.7, but it has a range there. And, and this is one unique chromosome set here. I'm not even showing you the so-called marker chromosomes. Remember, every cancer cell is different. Mm -hmm. the, the combination is like it's like shuffling these cards, these chromosomes. Every one of these is unique, and uh, m many of them won't even survive. But but once you have enough populations, there will be enough there to keep it going. Right. And what tends to lead to um, a collection of cells? So when we talk about cancer, it's, it's lung cancer, it's prostate right. cancer, it's breast right. cancer. It's not just one or two. It's a collection. It's a multiple. It's a collection of cells. Oh, yeah. You don't have cancer without a without a collection. Yes. It's a population of cells. Yes. Yeah. That ab absolutely one can we probably all have cancer cells in us, you know? But they just we never know it. You know, they they're so hard to, you know, prior to the Industrial Revolution of the 17, of the, in the 1700s, you know, cancer was known, but it was not common. And people still lived quite quite old. It was when we started uh, interfering with our environment, you had all these uh, uh, poisons in the air and, and, and things. We've increased the carcinogens. You know, cancer just over the decades, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, you know, because we're basically poisoning ourselves to death. If we don't kill ourselves outright, we're causing uh, aneuploidy, we get cancer, we get all kinds of, all kinds of things. And we're also decreasing our natural health. Healthy people have a strong resistance against cancer. Uh, you, can, you can even overcome it. But if you have other things, bad diet or other poisons in your environment, your, you, your level of health, which is way, way high compared to ca typical cancer cell, cancer period, all right? But what's happening in our environment, we're decreasing our natural health. So th that difference in viability and health between cancers be and, and, and us gets lower and lower, and we succumb to either mm -hmm. cancer or something else. Whereas our what we want to do is, going, is yeah, our health is going down. You know, and, uh, I mean, every year as it's, it's a population uh, and for all kinds of things, and of course, it affects cancer too. Because a healthy person is much healthier than a healthy tumor. Yes. <laughs> There's no yes. such thing as a healthy tumor. You know, but when you reduce that viability. So what, there's not this huge difference in, in viability between the healthy part of you and the cancer, you know, then the cancer can start winning out. That was lovely That's to right see, especially, <laughs> especially those images of the aneuploidy, because it really makes it make sense and how the, the, you can, the, health, the, the, the cells you show with aneuploidy just look sick. You can see they they're not sick. balanced. You can so, see. I mean, look at it. Hanselman and Boveri saw it with, in the night, late 1900s, you know, and it was obvious and clear. When I saw it, you know, when I finally started looking into this stuff, it was obvious to me, you know. It doesn't take a great deal to, to get this picture once you see it, you know, but most people are not, not exposed to it. And a, lot of, a lot of stuff in science and medicine is simple once you 
clear away all the crap and all the stuff that you think you know, you know? And uh, so, I mean, it's easy for me to say, but I've been working on this stuff since the mid 1990s, uh, but um, I know it's true. I mean, it just works. But once somebody gets the label of cancer, then you got a problem because what do you do? In fact, why don't we talk about that a little bit right now? We can stay away from the technical stuff for right now. Let's talk about the practical stuff that might uh, interest your viewers viewers more. Okay, so we so practical things are the screening thing, which I talk. There is the screening things that you're talking about are really don't really screen for cancer. <laughs> you know, they might screen for ill health of some sort, but they're not really for cancer. And then once you do it and you say, well, they got this problem here, then what do they do? Then they have to go and they say, is it cancer? Is it not? And they, that just infinite regress, you know, unless they look at the chromosomes, they won't ever really know. Mm -hmm. Unless they look at the cells with the microscope and they say, ah, yes, there's, we have cancer cells. When people wonder how do they know they have a cancer cell? They use what Theodore Boveri and Hanselman did and, and, and George Papanicolaou made famous with the pap smear. That's what they do to diagnose cancer. They look at the cells themselves. So if you've had a cancer diagnosis without confirmation that somebody has looked at your cells and seen enlarged nucleus and a chromosome imbalance, then your diagnosis is meaningless. You well, have for, ill health. Fortunately, only a pathologist can make a diagnosis of cancer. And a pathologist examples, examines the tissues. At least that was when I was in the business. Only a pathologist can diagnose cancer, not an oncologist. What's the role of the oncologist? The oncologist is the person that sort of uh, treats you and set, is a, sends off a sample to the pathologist and he says, you got cancer. Now the oncologist starts talking to you about surgery, radiation, drugs, and stuff like that. You know, uh, the oncologist does not diagnose cancer, a pathologist does. But the and oncologist treats it. And so this is my question then is, if we know that these cancer cells are sick cells and yep. the healthier the body is overall, the better it equipped it is to right. tackle the sick cells, it feels a huge contradiction to potentially actually with the radiation and chemotherapy, give more carcinogens and lower the health of the body to try and kill the cancer cells when increasing the health of the body is perhaps a more... You got it. You constant. absolutely got it. That's absolutely true. That's why, did you know, I've got, I've got it in my book, I've published it, uh, uh, they, they've done studies on this. Did you know something like 70 to 80% of oncologists, they've done studies in the United States and in UK, probably other places, these surveys, would not take the same chemotherapy and radiation that, that they give to their patients and they would not allow family members to take it. And think about that. that the oncologist is giving you radiation and chemo and all that would 80, 90, 70 to 80% would not take it and would not allow a family member to take it. They give it to you. All right, they, they, they know there's a problem here. And I've never met a person uh, uh, somebody who took chemo that didn't regret it. And being a cancer researcher over the years, a lot of people have talked to me about that, come to me, you know, and told me their story and they all regret it. Nobody said, oh, I'm happy. It worked. It was great, you know. And um, it was pure torture. Uh, and it just makes you sicker. And, um, and one other thing a lot of people don't know, one in six new cancers is caused by chemotherapy caused by the, the treatment itself. <laughs> so what There's nothing six. good about it. So this, a lot of these, what we'd call secondaries, are actually as a result of the treatment of the primary cancer, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they don't cure the cancer anyway. All they're doing, you can't kill all the cancer cells without killing the patient. It's mm -hmm. not possible. You know? So, so what you're doing is, you're, here, here's the person up here in the, Lower hand is the tumor, the vi relative viability. And as you give chemo or radiation, guess what? They're both, the cancer cells die faster. You know, they say, oh, the tumor's really, really sh shrinking because they're not as viable as, as your mm -hmm. normal cells. So no surprise that the cancer cells die off really, really quickly, but you're coming down too, mm -hmm. you see. And they have to stop it at some point 
before they kill the patient, but you can't kill all the cancer cells without killing the patient. So you leave the most resilient cancer cells are left in a less resilient host patient. Very weakened body. Right. The strongest of the cancer cells and the weakest of the normal cells. All right. You know, so surprise, surprise, surprise. Oh, year or two, whatever, the cancer came back or six months later. You know, that's the common story. You know, oh, it's got got back. resilience yeah. to tackle it a second time. Yeah. Or all these other problems. It's just a horror story. Absolutely a horror story. Absolutely. But now there are, there are, let me tell you, I want to get to this real quick before I forget about it. Because you know me, by now, I like to talk. And I go off on this limb and that limb and never never get to it. But uh, had I still had the opportunity before I got out of, you know, I'm 75. I'm retired now and I don't have, don't work in this area anymore. Uh, I would, if I could have gotten the money to, I would have gone around the world investigating all of the, the non-toxic therapies that people are using around the world. I don't know if you've heard of um, Coley's toxin. Uh, have you heard of Coley's toxin? Or the, yeah, it's in my book. This fellow, Coley's toxin, he was a physician in New York back in the early part of the 20th century and uh, his brand new doctor and one of his uh, uh, patients died of cancer uh, I may be getting some of these details wrong, but um, and that really affected him because he didn't know what to do about it. And he heard about this other patient who had apparently lethal cancer, but he got sick with an infection and then he got over the cancer. And the guy tracked him down years later and found this guy who survived. He was still healthy. And uh, after that infection, other people had seen this before, too. But this was in his own hospital. Mm-hmm. You know. And uh, where people had bacterial infections with high fever and they'd get over cancer. So he actually studied this over the years and used different bacteria. And finally, a combination of serratia marcations, and I forget the other one. And he would intentionally cause a, you know, a cancer, a person with cancer uh, infection for a fever, and high spiking fevers, you know. And the cancers would either improve or go away entirely. Sometimes, nice. sometimes never to come back. Sometimes they'd come back, you know, after a while. He'd do the same therapy again and they'd go away. And Coley's toxin is still being used in Europe and in Mexico, especially in Germany and other places. You know, high spiking fever. Turns out the cancer cells are very, very sensitive. They cannot tolerate fever very well. You know, they die out and they die out in droves in your normal body temperature. You go up just a couple of degrees. I mean, they're dying out even faster. These things are very, very wimpy. Can't tolerate yeah. the high temperature. And obviously right. the fever, we sweat, we excrete everywhere. There's yeah. opportunity for dead cells to come out of us. Yeah. So, and he, he wrote a book and his, his, his daughter, after he died, she compiled all of his data and other people around the world that were using his method and wrote a book about it. To this day, uh, Coley's method it is the most successful therapeutic method there is that I'm aware of personally on um, treat, treating cancer, even lethal cancer, all different kinds. It doesn't matter the type of cancer. It's independent of the type of cancer. And uh, it's, it, it doesn't always work, of course, but it's still the best, you know, like 40% or 50%, you know, that chemo radiation don't come anywhere near 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 that the risk of chemo radiation is that you kill the host you kill the body you kill the person yeah you're right then there's other other things that you could do i i came up with this uh what i call my perturbation theory of of treatment see that was perturbation if you have a norm like i i use it uh, forgive me i got to come up with a better analogy but this is this one makes the point you have granny and her uh, uh, Olympic athlete grandson walking down the street together. Everything is fine. Some thief comes along. Gra- now, the, the cancer cell is granny, you see, not so viable as the Olympic athlete grandson. And somebody comes along, steals granny's purse, and runs down the road. Granny and her Olympic athlete grandson chase after the thief. Well, granny suffers a heart attack <laughs> or a stroke or just gets winded, but her Olympic athlete son, which are your normal healthy cells, go down there and get the thief and get, get the purse, all right? 
So unfortunately, Granny died, even though he got the purse. And granny is the cancer cells. So this is what's going on with Coley's toxin. What you it was mere, you what you were doing was lethal stress for 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 Granny to run, but it was just exercise for the Olympic athlete grandson. The fever is, is an exercise for your normal healthy body. It is a lethal toxicity to the tumor cells. Mm. All right. Now think about that. Then if that's true, think about all the other ways you can perturb a person. Yes. You know, there's diet, these serious, serious, uh, like, like it's not just diet, it's like fasting. They, they do fasting in Mexico, and I think also in, uh, none of this stuff hardly is, is, almost none of this is done in the USA. In Germany, they, they, have, they do a lot of this, and again, like in Mexico, they have these clinics, and they put these people on these, these uh, uh, fast, you know, but they have to be uh, uh, monitored because it's serious, serious reduction in, in fasting here. And of course, they, they're, not, they're not intended to kill the patient, obviously, just stress the patient, but then mortally fatal to the cancer cells, mm. you say, that are there. And, and that, that's one way how they do this perturbation. Uh, and there are others. I think those sweat lodges like they had in, in, in what, Sweden and the American Indians used to have these sweat lodges. People would go into these places and they sweat a lot and steam and everything. And I know they do it in Scandinavia. You know, I don't know. I, I, these are hypotheses. The words that I, the stuff that I know for a fact is the fasting. And I know Coley's toxin for a, for a fact, but I don't know about the sweat lodges and these other things, but it'd be interesting to know if that has a therapeutic effect. And th you, use your imagination. You know, use your imagination of the ways that you could basically do like a, a stress, but it would be like the stress on the, on the notion of an exercise, like an athlete, you know, where it's, it's a survivable, it's a reversible type of thing you know, that would be irreversible for a wimpy cancer cell. Yes, yes. You see? Yes. That's what it, I would say that if you're constantly moving around, you know, a fast, you know, cholitoxin, are you doing this and that, you know, which only exercises you and you're okay after a while with the cancer cells, man, they can't keep track. This, I'm speaking out loud now as a hypothesis. Yes. I would yes. have gone around the world. Some of that is a fact, you know, but I would like to look at all the other ways that people have noticed that are therapeutic benefits uh, for cancer patients. I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I just don't know it for a fact. So what we know is the cancer cells are aneuploidy cells. They're weak, they're yes. weak, ill cells. And what we need to do is encourage those to That's die right. off while increasing the health of the, That's right. the well cells. And Exer that exercise. Exercise, I call it exercise. You know, you're perturbing. You know, a healthy person, I noticed I was helping this younger guy, 26 years old, I'm uh, 75 now, helping him build our, a shed out back. I used to do the things he can. You know, I can't do it now. I'm, you know, I mean, he's like an athlete up there on the ladder and stuff. You know, I'm like the cancer cell guy. I hang around there for a while, but you know, I can't jump around like he can, you know? So it's... Uh, it, it's like making it harder and harder for a cancer cell to, to, to stay alive while you're not hurting the person. And we can reduce our risk by reducing our risk to carcinogens, to poison, right. describing carcinogens of what right. consider poison in our environment. Yes, all, all of those things, we all, we all know about that, those things. But like uh, for people who, who have not heard about aneuploidy, chromosomal imbalance, I mean, that's really what it is. That, that's what cancer is. And I'm, cert, I'm absolutely certain of that. We don't even study carcinogens in this country to see whether or not they cause aneuploidy. In Japan, they've been doing it for, God, over a decade or two decades probably. They're absolutely astonished that Americans don't analyze carcinogens to see if they cause aneuploidy. Cancer. All carcinogens cause, that have been tested cause aneuploidy. All do. Because the cancer research just certainly is not different aware. ways. Whether it's asbestos, radiations, chemicals, or anything, if it if you have something that does not cause aneuploidy, it is not a carcinogen. If you have something that causes aneuploidy, chromosomal imbalance, it, it is a carcinogen, or at least potential. I say potential in the, you know, for example, you can have things that if you do it in a laboratory and you do it in cell culture, 
or immune compromised animal and you inject it in them, for example, it might cause aneuploidy and cancer in that animal. But if you take the same poison and, and you put it orally, in, but your body, your natural immune system could totally inactivate it and degrade it, it might be a, 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 an aneuploidogen, something causes aneuploidy in cell culture or immune compromised animals, or if you inject it rather than give it orally, you say. And it has to do with the route, like uh, the, the, not only does the uh, uh, amount make the poison, it's also the route of administration. Mm. So um, you'd have to look all different kinds of ways as to whether as to whether or not a chemical or any substance or radiation. We know radiation causes aneuploidy, uh, and uh, yeah, you, in fact, it's inevitable. <laughs> presumably, medicines. X-rays cause aneuploidy. <laughs> presumably, medicines and vaccines are also able to be carcinogens as well. Yes, yeah, I have no doubt. Many medicines are. In fact, all all chemotherapy is carcinogenic, all of it. And the radiation they use to treat treat uh, cancer is carcinogenic. So stay clear. I don't know a non-carcinogenic chemotherapy. Well, all oncologists do, in my opinion, do far more harm than good if they're using uh, uh, chemo and radiation. I cannot think of that ever being useful or good for any human being. But unfortunately, we've got decades, maybe a century behind us now. They were using radiation back in the old days, you know, for treatment. But, but how are you going to stop? How are you going to stop that overnight? People are so entrained. An oncologist couldn't become an oncologist if he didn't treat people with chemotherapy and radiation. He couldn't, he couldn't, wouldn't be allowed to work on cancer patients. He wouldn't be hired by a hospital. Thank you very, very much for your time. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found this conversation useful. There are four ways I can help you grow your practice for free. First of all, go to www.marklandmethod.com forward slash grow. And there you will find the opportunity to take part in the free Profit Without Pills course. You'll also find a link where you can register for the free sales and pricing training triage call. In addition to that, you can sign up for the free weekly email newsletter. And finally, please do leave a five-star review and share this conversation so that I can continue to get access to high-quality speakers and experts who will bring their knowledge, their ideas and their learnings to share with you here on this platform.